book is not just about big waves, as the title suggests. Can you tell us how you married those three groups of mariners, scientists, and big wave riders? There's, the book is really about giant waves, but there are a number of different kinds. And so um, there, there are, you know, let's just take a 100-foot wave. You could have a 100-foot wave out here that, you know, would be every toe surface dream. Or you could have a 100-foot wave that's hitting a ship uh, in 40-foot seas. And that would be a rogue wave. Um, the term rogue wave gets used a lot, freak wave, and it's used in the vernacular, but what scientists mean when they say it is a wave that's at least two times as big as the seas around it, and possibly three or four are even bigger. And those waves are very unusual. They're, you know, they're not under well understood. It was only in 1995 when scientists kind of acquiesced that they existed. Um, the, prior to that, they thought they were kind of tall tales of the sea, and, and the captains whose boats got damaged would, would sort of say, yes, it was such a huge wave. Um, and there were lots of rumors of them. Ernest Shackleton, the great polar explorer, uh, hit a 100-foot rogue wave crossing the Southern Ocean to get help. And that, you know, he thought at first it was, um, you know, clouds in the sky at night, and then he realized that in his, in probably 30-something foot seas, there was this 100-foot rogue wave, and it was so big that he, he literally thought it was in the clouds above, and that can't have been a good moment when you realize that's not clouds in the sky, it's actually a wave towering over you. But, so rogue waves are very mysterious beasts, and um, in fact, one of the chapters in the books takes place in this hotel, where, um, all the top wave scientists had convened to discuss some of uh, the sort of unknowns, uh, the climate model, the, the sort of limitations of climate modeling because they were not predicting these giant waves. Um, they, they were losing a lot of ships. Um, and, and then, of course, there were things that had, again, not been really well understood. Like when Katrina breached um, New Orleans, nobody really thought that storm surge would have was going to be as quite as big as it was. Like our hurricane modeling was not where it needed to be. Our our knowledge of the ocean in its most extreme was not where it needed to be, and certainly our knowledge of these nonlinear, really weird, monstrous rogue waves was very much in its infancy. But in the beginning, um, I was especially fascinated by rogue waves because I read a, an article in the New York Times that said that two large ships a week were disappearing, uh, freighters, thousand foot ships. And, and so you lose a thousand foot ship twice a week and, and nobody hears about it. And to me, you know, a lot of the, of the stories that really capture my interest start with the question, what do you mean that, you know, there's a neighborhood of great white sharks in San Francisco? Or what do you mean that there's guys trying to serve a hundred foot wave? Or what do you mean that they're losing two, a thousand foot ships a week in, a, in an era where we can find atoms? And so, that, that was a really driving force of the book. And then the third type of wave that I really focused on was tsunamis, which are, again, really interesting, uh, not well understood, but better understood than they have been. Um, and we've had two major, major tsunamis in the past seven years. Um, but if you go back as recently as 250 years, there were much bigger tsunamis. And if you go back to prehistory, where they're starting to dig up the seabed, especially around here, um, and look and see, there have been mega, mega tsunamis. I and mean, this is something that, that, that happens in the world. And um, I could go on about this for a long time, but uh, changes in climate lead to changes in earthquake frequency and um, volcanic activity, which in turn are really related to tsunamis. So I set out to find anybody who could take me either literally or figuratively to the top of one of these waves, into these waves, so that I could understand it well enough to by extension take readers. And if looking at the three groups of people that you studied in this book, which of the three do you think are more in tune with the ocean and what it can do? Oh, oh there's, no, there's no doubt whatsoever that the, the big wave surfers that I spoke to are the shamans of the um, ocean. Uh, they understand the ocean in a way that, um, I mean, if you talk to an astronaut and they're going to, who's been to the moon, they can understand the moon in a way that all the guys sitting in mission control, they may be the most brilliant people in the world at their computer monitors. They, and, and I met so many brilliant people writing this book, but they are not going to understand it in that sort of gut, heart way that the, the people who are actually in the element understand. And in fact, a lot of the scientists that I spoke to never went to sea. They, um, a few of them did, but most of them don't want to. And a lot of the really um, 
scientific work on waves is very mathematical, and in fact, in the case of rogue waves, it's very quantum physics and things like that. So they're the, the same mind that wants to unravel these equations. Like if you look at a, uh, an equation for a rogue for a, wa a nonlinear wave, it really looks like chickens stepped in ink and walked around on a piece of paper. Like it's it's so complicated. It, it's just it, it's unbelievable, and they're so smart, but they're not necessarily. Um, they're not necessarily seagoing people. And of course, then you have the, this, you know, the other group that was really um, aware of, of the ocean in a very personal, emotional way were the ship captains. And their lives depend on it every day. Yeah. Well, I was pretty impressed, Susan, that you got out there. And in the book, she even talks about before the jet ski, you actually swim out on a pretty flat day, though there's no such thing really as flat, but a pretty flat day with Laird, and that was even knowing that there are sharks in the world. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, I honestly, like, I always think if I see a shark, it's a good day. It's like, if you think you're going to see a shark, you know, get a lottery ticket that day, because that's how rare they are. But, um, yeah, we swam out to Jaws because I wanted to see the reef. Um, I wanted to see if... It, 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 they talked about a fan-shaped reef, and I thought, I'd like to see that. Um, and National Geographic did a, uh, some bathymetry uh, graphics on it, and so I wanted to see, but when I got out there, I realized you almost have to be above to see because it's so big. But I did get to see how incredibly elemental and spooky the water is there. I mean, there really, <laughs> there is a set of jaws down there, the giant boulders, and I, Laird uh, was, he trusted that I guess if there was some trouble that I could be reasonably counted upon to handle myself. And um, he did take me into some pretty extreme conditions at times. He took me through the barrel at Chopu um, on a jet ski, he took me down Jaws, not on the biggest day, but it was big enough for me um, on a jet ski. And I, I got to see a lot more firsthand and feel a lot more firsthand what was going on. Of course, nothing compared to what they go through. And yet, I. I had the same experience with being around very big waves that I did being around very big sharks, is that um, when you're actually in the moment, and it, you're, you're less scared because you're very present. There's this awesome, beautiful thing that's so much more powerful than you are. And, and you forget yourself, and you're just in it. And, and I think that I learned that fear is a projection, that you, you're projecting what might happen to you or what happened in the past to you. That doesn't really happen when you're very, very present. And I think that incredible moment of being just really in it is what attracts people to surfing at all levels. You're really in that moment. You're, that's what, kind of what people meditate in a cave for 30 years to do. So, Well, there's a story in the book with Brett Lickle and one of the hugest waves at another place that they call Egypt out there. And I'm wondering, having read the book, when they came in, this was a day of just gargantuan cartoonish proportions that may sound unbelievable because no one was really there to document it. But given the history and the validity that Laird and these guys have, I mean, they really do ride these ridiculous waves. They came in and it was a shocking experience that they had. Can you fill us in just without spoiling the story, but a little bit on that day. And were they able to convey to you that moment that you talk about when it was all said and done? I had to pry that out of them over the course of six weeks. I, I had to report all around that, that incident to find out what had happened. I mean, Brett Lickle almost lost his life. Laird saved him. He stripped off his wetsuit, tied a tourniquet, came up on Baldwin Beach naked. I mean, it was like, it's the craziest thing. It, it, there was only um, five or six people um, who could really talk about it. Um, and and I, I just spent a long time... I'm a really immersive journalist, and I will ask the same question a hundred times and follow the person around until I get it. And um, it, what was really great was that everybody had kind of the same story. They don't brag about it. They don't want to go around saying it was the, these were the biggest waves they'd ever ridden, but I found that out. And, um, uh, you know, I think I would like to ask Pat Caldwell if one of the reasons they put that bu buoy off of Maui is because of this day. Because that was fairly um, bizarre, what happened that day. They expected 40-foot waves, and they, according to Don Shearer, I'll let Derek also talk about Don Shearer, so I'm not going to speak to his credibility. I'm going to let Derek speak to his credibility. Said that he knows that there were 100-foot waves there, and there were probably even 120-foot waves there, and nobody predicted that, and it was very strange visibility. The airport was on uh, VFR, so the pilots were making their approach 
um, very slowly and um, fully on instruments uh, right till they landed. So there was no way for Don in his helicopter to fly around and like, like he usually does, like in the picture that you saw. It was, it's just the weirdest day that ever happened. And um, it reminded me a little bit of when I, again, when I was at Outside, we had um, sent John Krakauer to Mount Everest to uh, figure out what was going on with people being guided up Everest. And one of the questions that we had was, should people be able to be guided up Everest? And of course, this incredible uh, series of events unfolded, which I'm sure most people here are familiar with. And it was like that on that day. Like, it was just a, a weird confluence of extremes. Um, and it was extremely, it forms the climax of the book, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, it's, it's amazing, actually, that they all got out of there that day. It really is. And it was a life-changing day, wasn't it? It was a really life, I mean, Brett has never gone back to surf big waves again. Um, you know, I, I, and I think it was a wake-up call for Laird as well. I think he understood that moment that he was going to have to evolve his equipment to surf the bigger waves than he had surfed before. And he just, you know, to hear him talk about it, he couldn't move, he, he was, St staying still and moving backwards on this way, and that's how he had never encountered anything like that before, and he realized what that would mean, that next level. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why he's really focused on foiling now, because that seems to be a frictionless way, and, and there's going to have to be more speed involved. But again, I think, let's get Derek to talk about this. And yeah. we will. There's, yeah. there's a slide. I'm going to bypass yeah. just one slide here, because... Okay. This is, this is the last one before we're going to introduce Derek Donut to you because he's a, he's a great uh, wealth of talent. But this is, uh, even out of the frame here, it was such a huge photograph, I couldn't even pull it down and do justice oh, to it. There was a little guy hanging up there. There was a guy being winched and he, you had to strain your eyes to even see him and it was a recovery mission. And it was really fascinating in the book, Susan, when you were talking to some of the salvages. And I thought of it again last week with the ship that was grounded off the the coast of Italy oh, yeah. with all of the passengers on board and what went down there it turns into a massive salvage operation and um, can you explain what kind of an insight you got through these guys into the number of ships that go down the treacherous conditions the salvage operations and what this is on the right hand side here that kind of monitors all of that too um, the missing ships was a big part of the research that I did for the book and the reporting. And, and this is both related to that. Um, the men on the left are from South Africa. And South Africa has the world's most, the world's gnarliest um, salvagers. And the salvage, um, industrial large scale salvage operations are incredibly important environmentally because a lot of these ships are oil tankers that are too big to go through the Suez Canal. So they're going around the tip of Africa and there's a very fast moving current called the Agullis Current uh, like the Gulf Stream, but comes very close to shore. And then you get from the Southern Ocean these huge storms that come up with nothing blocking them. Huge long fetch, giant winds, cold waters from Antarctica. And they hit the Agullis Current, and it's like this giant tra oceanic train wreck. Um, and it, it, it is the um, southeast coast of Africa is known as the Wild Coast. Um, it's a rogue wave factory. And it's a rogue wave factory in one of the busiest shipping areas of the world. So there's um, two or three huge salvage companies. And they um, do a lot of the same very treacherous, very um, high risk things that, that, that the extreme surfers do. But they do it with 100 um, thousand tons of cyanide to get out of the hold or a tanker full of oil or and they do all kinds of things to get people and chemicals off these ships before the ships break up they try to tow the ships out so they don't get again um, you know basically broken in half which is what happens to the big tankers when these waves move and they snap like pencils almost